underneath. And then there, I was going to work on it. You know, I did it and I kept looking at it. I'm going to work on it. I really didn't end up working on it because I don't think I could have made it better. And as I looked at it more, this stuff just kind of happened as I was going and pulling paint off all those figures. I didn't really try too hard. I just started by squirting a paint on and mashing it down and just like I showed you. And then I painted some things out. But one thing I noticed really interesting here was this is how it works. As you got this figure here, and this was basically um, after I pulled the paint off of the paper, put paper on here and pulled the paper off the paint. It was loaded up with paint, so I smeared it over here. I just slapped it down over here. And then before I knew it, it started looking like somebody's standing there. Okay, so I went with it. But a day later, I'm looking at it and going, looking at this. And it's like two ghost images of children. Oh. I mean, go right back in there with paint and a line and make figures out of it. I mean, that, that's how it happens. It's like, you have to sort of recognize it, but if you're not used to doing it and seeing patches of paint turn into things like the Rorschach test, it's a little difficult to see. But once you start getting into it, you see all kinds of things. The, the possibilities are limitless, you know? So um, I would say, I wouldn't worry about it. You just keep working on it, on it until it turns into something. You know, and that's the beautiful part about it. And with acrylic, it dries so fast. I mean, with oil paint, this is a nightmare. And then you'd have newspapers soaked in oil. I've done it before. You have newspapers soaked in oil laying all around. It starts getting smelly when it when it's on rags and paper and sitting around. So then you can't really put it in the garbage. You got to go to toxic waste. So it's really a big pain. So when I painted these oils the last time, the one I just said, I didn't use any newspaper. I just used some stuff, some product that made it kind of satiny and I mixed it with the paint and put it in and it had a nice shiny look to it. But, you know, at some point I did a few of them and that's going to run dry and then I'll go back to whatever this or whatever else I did before. It's funny how it runs in cycles. So anyway, let's uh, go here. I was looking at some things here. And uh, let's see if I can do this. Let's look at a few ideas here. I'm going to set up my stand and let's see if it works. It did a little bit yesterday. Uh, I need a different thing here. Uh, not yet. Here, try this one. Okay. It's a hack. All right. There we go. Moving right along. Okay. David. So we're looking at something everybody kind of knows. Let me get out of the way here. And I'm just doing a sculpture. Just uh, I'm going to sort of talk a little bit about when artists start doing things. And then when they hit the end of their career, things look different, even, do, even though they're doing the same thing. So David, he's over in the uh, Florence in the Academy inside the building. There's a big copy outside where the original stood on the piazza. But um, when you look at this, it's Michelangelo, and he's fairly young. And just imagine, it's huge. You know, it's very big. I mean, when I was standing there, I probably came up to about there, you know, looking up at it. And it's really polished, and it's sort of like, hey, he didn't use power tools. You know, he did all this stuff by hand, and it's really incredible. But yet, it's the sign of a young artist that's wowing people with his uh, facility and his abilities to make things look real. And that was important then. And But as he went on, as he goes on, things change a lot. And in the very same gallery, this is in the center. It's a rotunda. And there's, I don't know how many, but on each side of the wall leading up to it, there's these big unfinished sculptures. I think it's called the slaves and it was supposed to be for some Pope's tomb, but they're relatively unfinished, but I think he, they get so abstract. It, it has a look like this. Let me put one up. And this isn't exactly what I saw, but it's very close. Is it my, let's see. Okay. So late Michelangelo here. Okay. And it's like, what happened to the shine? Look at those weird proportions of the Christ figure, like a broken up mannequin or a marionette. And 
the sort of rough hewn figures, you know, really it's tore into and allegedly a self portrait of Michelangelo. But I guess at this point, and we can see it in painting too, is that when an artist, after a certain point, they get to a stage where they don't care anymore about what the audience thinks, and it becomes a challenge between the artist and the material. So again, it's more like a boxing match and he's got his chisels and there's chisel marks everywhere in here and you can just see him digging into it. And they have something called the truth of materials in art. And he's showing you his whole process and what it's made out of without glossing it over, just like painters, like the Renaissance painters when they started, they hit their brush strokes. They glossed it all over and made beautiful shiny surfaces. And by the end of the Renaissance, when you get up to Titian, he's using his hands and rags and you see thumbprints and fingerprints in it because he's just pasting paint on the canvas and plowing through it physically. So it's the physical presence of the artist is not being uh, hidden anymore, okay? They're like reveling in it, that it's raw and it's direct and it's uh, an experience that'll never happen again and it's frozen in stone or frozen in paint. So let's take that a little bit further here. We'll look at some other ideas like that. Let's see, who do we got here? Let's see, it's abstract. We won't get to that yet. Okay, let's look at this. Okay. Mm -hmm. It was working better yesterday. Okay, so we got Edgar Degas, early Edgar. Okay, and beautiful drawer, one of the best drawers that ever lived, and he studied with one of the best, and I'll show you his teacher's picture in a minute, was Jean-Dominique Wang. And um, when he starts out, he does it a lot like his teacher. It's very specific drawing. And you notice he's a post-impressionist, but he still draws classically like the masters do, where a lot of the other post-impressionists really didn't. They had different ways of drawing. But he was like really a true draftsman. He was sort of born that way, born to be a drafter. And when you look at it, it's already kind of abstract. I mean, with the heads sort of faces, you know, you get, it's rhythm, patterns, patterns, dark shapes. One thing flows into another thing. And it's almost like one big abstract shape. And then it's broken up on the inside. And there's already hints of it going rough. I mean, in the beginning, it's really smooth. And this is still sort of moving out of his early phase. But when he gets to his late phase, it's more um, what we just saw with Michelangelo. Okay, so now that's a pastel drawing. It's on heavy, uh, you could say sandpaper, okay, because of the, they used uh, pieces of glass pasted on the paper for the grit. And that was perfect for heavy chalk because the chalk would fall in between the grit and the recesses and stay on the paper. When you look at it, it doesn't, number one, yeah, you can see what's going on, but still at the same time, it's kind of nondescript and abstract. It's white shapes going into the body. The body's in a different kind of pose that takes it out of being a body like it does in his earlier work. I mean, even the pattern on the walls are all sort of, just roughed in and he's letting the chalk do the work and it just has this rough quality to it and it's like he's taking this dry pieces of dirt and working on a lumpy piece of paper and he's just physically really pushing it in and making something out of it as he goes instead of having a plan of you know a group of ballerinas and this composition or that it's more like he just starts with maybe a shade or a color and then he works it into something as he goes and that's really sort of the modern direct approach that people took and here's uh you can see where he's coming from in the beginning uh, uh let me wait a minute there's got to be a better way there's his teacher and and then the neoclassicist um, smooth layers of um, oil glaze, everything, just incredible paintings. I mean, his drawings, his pencil drawings, it's like the first time pencil became famous or used widely in fine art was like the early 1830s. And he 
if he never painted, I just love his drawings, period. But he's known to use lenses. I mean, his realism is just hyper real. Even in the decorations and like the fan and the feathers, it gets a little dark on the screen, but everything's there. All the feathers in place, the bracelet, the skin tones, the extra vertebrae he threw in, the maker, <laughs> you know, what's up with those proportions? And then I just figure, well, you look at the size of the canvas and it's not so much about being accurate here. It's about making her fit inside the canvas. And we saw Titian's, uh, here, let's do this really quick. Well, I got it up here. Okay. Gee, I wonder where he got the idea from, you know? And here's early Titian, which is in the Renaissance. So, you know, whatever that is, 150, 200 years later, um, 300, I don't know. No math here. But anyway, uh, Titian got it from his teacher and friend was Giorgione. And Giorgione has one just like this, but the Venus is the other way and there's no background. I'll talk about that in a minute. Anyway, so you can see somebody like this painstakingly do this and taking a long time, layer over layer, and probably working um, more than, you know, a studio full of paintings that are all in process. But the thing with the glazes is they take long time to dry and they have to be dry to put another layer on top or else you start messing it up it starts digging up and looking weird but the way he could make things shine you know the silk dresses that he painted the drapery and all the different textures and the way the light hits it it's incredible you know and i mean he was a favorite artist for a lot of abstract artists like american artists william de willem willem de kooning and arshel gorky because they started looking at how he put together the negative shapes with the figure, the positive shapes. And I mean, I traced around a few of these once, and I was surprised. It looked just like an Arshel Gorky painting, an early one. So, you know, and they always said that, and I never saw it until I traced around. And, oh, that's what they're talking about. Okay. So now, here, let's take uh, this guy here. Mm -hmm. And I got these right at the place where the paintings are. Okay, I guess that's it. So, let's take the uh, first one here. Okay, Caravaggio. Caravaggio is uh, Michelangelo. Another Michelangelo, Di Marisi. And... He was sort of farmed down to Rome from his family to study to be an artist. And as soon as he got in Rome, he was already mistreated. They set him up with some Monsignor and they gave him money to give to the Monsignor to feed him. But the Monsignor kept giving him salad. So he referred to him as Monsignor Salad and basically was starving him. And he was working in a sculpture yard and trying to learn sculpture. And he abandoned that and took up painting. And he's one that they know used lenses. In this very painting, it's in the Villa Borghese in Rome. And when you walk in, there was a student there from the JC. He was living up in, uh, where was he? He was up in Florence. And I told him I was coming to Rome. His dad's a teacher, was a teacher at the JC. And he was living in Florence for a couple of years up to then. So I said, come on down and meet me. So he came down, we walked around and looked at paintings. And when we walked into the main gallery, there's this painting. And it doesn't show so much in this as it does in a real painting, but the head looks like it got pressed and it's a lens distortion because it's like cut off this way and it's very oblique. And when you're standing in front of it, it's really obvious. And I tried to explain to him, he used lenses. Oh, no, no. He couldn't. <laughs> He's so academic. He couldn't get it. He couldn't see it. No, they were great. They were great. And the thing is, there are no drawings by Caravaggio really that exist. And they know he used lenses. But again, it's what he did with it. And what, what you got to think that this is the tail end of the Renaissance. Late 1500s is his earliest paintings, like I saw 1599 in the Uffizi. But then when he got down to Rome in the Borghese, there was a cardinal that collected his work. It was his house, Scipione. I forgot his last name, but he was from Borghese, which was the Borgia family. It goes all the way back to Rome. And he couldn't show the paintings because 
uh, the church really didn't sanction him. They wouldn't collect his paintings because he used uh, all his friends, the street thugs and hookers that hung out and had, you know, they had tears in their clothes. They had dirty fingernails and he presented them as saints. But they were great paintings. But the thing is that it was mannerism was the the um, style that held sway. And that's like abstracting the figure, like the late, late uh, Michelangelo we just saw, stretching everything out and making elongated and twisting them and bending them to get expressive uh, power out of just the pose. Instead of telling the story, they were doing it physically, visually. So he said, forget it. I want to paint realism like the Lombardi painters, like Bellini was one of the first painters that used lenses in the middle, early to middle Renaissance. And that's what, that was the day painting changed and it became photographic. But you just look at things like that big neck versus that little head. And then the fruit, the way the fruit's painted, there's uh, a one that's a little bit later. When you look at this one, there's still sort of jagged edges and it's like all there. But there's another one stand, hanging next to it. And when you hang next to it, it's really like the edges are tighter. It's just like right down the road, it got better. He's got more rotten fruit. You can, I mean, you can almost taste it and feel it, reach in and feel it. It's so real. So he had the skill to take that projected image and turn it into beautiful oil paintings. And the touch the guy had, when you see his brushwork, it's just like he had such a touch. We don't even think of that, you know, you just think of how great the painting is. And then even when you look at his paintings, and I read about that too, is where he took his brush handle and he would just scrawl into the wet paint to line up the lens the next day. And then when he was in, uh, I guess it was, I don't know if it was, I guess, yeah, it was Rome, right? He was always on the run. The church wanted him dead. He killed somebody in a tennis match. And there's a long story behind that. It sounds, you know, it just sounds like he was a murderer, but it was a big thing with this guy named Renuccio who kept antagonizing him. And people picked on him because they thought he was some bizarre flub. And the story, he was in a restaurant and uh, in Rome and he ordered uh, some artichokes. I forgot, too steamed and too with oil. And the waiter was making fun of him. So he's, stood up and slashed him in the face with a knife and said, who do you think you're talking to, you prick? <laughs> so, and then he'd walk around town at night with a black cape and carry a sword looking for trouble. And, you know, he's almost like criminally insane. And then he went to Naples and then he had to leave there, run away from there. He, he went to um, Sicily. He had to leave there. He went to Malta. And then he hooked up with the Knights of St. John, the Knights Templar. And the last thing they say is that he was, they made him a knight and he was dining with the head guy named Wijinku, some French knight that was the lead man. And they basically had their big fortress in Malta. There were a bunch of fortresses in the, in the quarter in the bay there. And the next thing you know, he's thrown in the hole in the jail and it's 22 feet deep and it's got walls that sort of taper in towards the bottom so you can't climb my food i don't know how it works but you can't get out and he escaped <laughs> and they think it was an inside job and it was the cardinal's family in rome they had relatives in genova and they brought a boat down and broke him out and then took him back to genova but at the same time um he got back on a boat and they went down the coast and all of a sudden they pulled up into some small town and dumped them off. And they say that, well, the ship pulled away and his paintings were still on it. So he ran 40 miles through malaria swamps to chase, chase the boat. And then he died from malaria, which was nonsense because I read a book with the police reports and what they did was he had 40 swordsmen waiting in town for him. When he got off the boat, it was a fight and he didn't win 40 against one. And that was it. He died before he was 40 years old. He was 39. And, uh, but he was quite an interesting character. And the last line in the book was he rejected the society that rejected him. And, um, a lot of his work was lost in the bombings during the war, world war two. So they don't know exactly everything he did. 
Here's another one. Yeah. And it tends to be a self-portrait, this one. They said it's it's called uh, the Bacchus with malaria. And if you look at it, his face is more green. You can't really tell on here now, but the face is more green and the body's more flesh tone. And all that means is that when I'm looking at it, he had trouble with the face and he repainted it a couple of times and it was painted on a different day. And then when you look at his black in between, when Leonardo did it before, his kid is light and dark. Um, he uses that, you know, years later, but they, they call his tenebrism, but it's a kid of skill. But I think the big difference is this is when he's working, you look into the black and it's just black. It just, just nothing's in it. When you look at Leonardo, there's always detail. You can see stuff in the shadows. So it's sort of like, he's just projecting it up and painting it and just painting all the dark stuff, just dark with no no care about anything being in it. And it really pulls off well. But oftentimes in a lot of his paintings, you see weird things like a hand in the foreground is smaller than the one behind it, which is as big as a baseball mitt. You know, and they're just lens distortions, again, being painted on different days. And I think probably what he did was he painted in sectors or perimeters. One day it's this one, the next day it's this one, the next day it's another section. And then he puts them together that way. But here's a close-up of the face. So you can see, even here, there's something going on that's different than what happens here. And I know it's a highlight and everything, but just the color shift and the way it looks and the way that lip's painted. Let me hold that still. It's like he changed a lot of things on the face even after he painted it. But look at how great the leaves are painted. You know, I mean, everything's so sort of real, but yet it's kind of a statue at the same time. Okay, and then with that, they have these really big paintings in the same house. And the guy's house is full of Caravaggio paintings and Bernini sculptures, so not bad. You had to have some bank to get that stuff. But here's a, let's move it up here. Now, this painting must be at least eight feet high. and the thing I noticed here was the snake when I was standing in front of it and the feet are on the snake crushing the snake and it's like I looked at the way that snake was painted I'm going that's amazing just the way the brush just fought, mimicked the movement of the snake so nice and smooth and then everything else is painted so perfectly and yet you can see brush strokes you know he's not hiding everything and here's a weird distortion look at the size of the body and the size of the head you know, painted different times because that's way too small for that body, especially a young boy. And the drapery and everything is just shiny and the skin tones. And with his paintings, when they put them in a church, even the later ones down here, he kind of paints a butt end of a floor or a pedestal or a shelf. And with these dark backgrounds in the dark churches, when you walk inside, it's like they're real people on a stage. You know, they have that illusion. And you have to wonder, he's probably thinking about that when he was putting them together. Now, here's another big one by him. Same place, same Borghese. Great place to go. It's like in the middle of a like Central Park in Rome. And you wander around and the German philosopher Goethe's house is there where he retired. I mean, it's just, it's like you're kidding me. All this stuff's here. Somebody's pulling my leg. But when you look at this, I mean, in all these sort of weird pinwheel abstractions with feet coming out of the darkness, hands. And a lot of the later paintings, you see arms and hands that don't belong to anybody. <laughs> They're sort of like there was something there and he painted out, but he decided to leave the hand. And a lot of those are in depositions like in St. Paul, the late paintings where they're all twisted up and going towards Baroque. But anyway, really amazing things. And he would take these things. I don't know how he got around. He must've had to roll them up and, and uh, get out of town fast. But it's amazing they still survive. And I think a lot of them still survive because the guy bought them, that Cardinal bought them. And to slap the Cardinal in the face, he was next in line for the Pope, but they didn't do it. They didn't give it to him. And a lot of it had to do with his association with Caravaggio. But he would have great dinner parties, the Cardinal. And one of his main guests was Galileo. And that's where Galileo met Caravaggio. And you can just imagine that lenses 
you know, became a big topic from telescopes. So that's probably how he sort of got onto it. All right. So there's Caravaggio. And um, let's see. He's still a favorite painter of a lot of modern painters because he was just so on the edge. Um, let's see. Titian. Not yet. Let's see what else. Oh, okay. Let's look at something different. Speaking of Rome, this is, these are the ones I got in Rome when I saw Matisse and Bonard show. So some of these I never saw before, but I got the cards here. So let's look at this one here first. All right, get this out of the way. Okay, so there's Matisse. And when I showed up at the place where all these paintings are, it's like it's an ancient, you know, it's a war museum of ancient Rome, uh, weapons and chariots and armor. And you go upstairs and it's an art gallery. And then there it said Matisse and Bonari. Oh, you're kidding. So I went in and then like this one, for instance, never saw it, never saw it in a book, never saw it reproduced. Just one of those paintings that a European bought and stayed in Europe and they never let it out until recently, I guess, when I, whenever the show was or they traveled around Europe. But you think it eventually get over here. And it's pretty amazing that you study a painter for so many years and you realize there's paintings you never saw. And those really become interesting because, I mean, a lot of them are really good. One more, you know, better than a lot of them they show that are supposed to be the famous paintings, but just typical piece with the pattern. And I mean, he's kind of a simple painter, but at the same time, look at how he can get expressions on faces and in poses just without a lot of like what we saw in Ang, Degas teacher, all the rendering and all, you know, it's a different time now and it's more direct painting and remember Matisse is the king of crude and here's uh never saw this one Bonard um, when you look at that just that little bit of white slap down here that pulls over her eye and then there's just a slight shadow and then you look at the face and there's not much detail on it but it's very subtle kind of a small head for big shoulders but at the same time it works you know and I, I get the sense that he's kind of it's one size and he keeps painting it down he's painting it down a little bit and he changes the background and these paintings have a really crusty crunchy texture to them like just hard like a worn out wall a lot of his paintings but then he varnishes them and there's a certain shine to them and they always don't reproduce that well because I've seen him in reproductions, a lot of his paintings, and it's like, eh. And I see him down at the art museum, and it's a whole different experience seeing the real painting. Here's one that, one of my favorite paintings ever is Bonard. And it, this woman in a bathtub with a dachshund down on the bottom here. here. And it's funny how that dark shape anchors the whole painting because the painting's so bright and light. He's got this woman in a bathtub, but look at a bathtub. It wouldn't hold water. It'd spill out the shape of it. So he's doing a shape to kind of fit into the painting. Look at the pattern and look at how everything is just, you know, nothing straight. And I looked at it again and I thought, oh yeah, it looks like she's in an aquarium. It's like she's inside the fish tank and the light's shining through and it's picking up all the stuff underwater. It's got that kind of glow to it. And he's, he uses that dog a lot. He puts faces over here in the corner. There's a lot of camouflage in his work, but that's a good one. He did another version that's not quite as good, but some, you know, it's interesting how you do the same thing on something else exactly the same way. And, you know, one's, one's just better than the other one. It just happens to be on, on the day you're painting. Okay. And then here's another Bonard. Never saw that one. There's a lot of them like it, but not this particular one. And here's your figure that's just sort of a sidebar over here. You can get a sense for his kind of scrubbing and rough kind of texture. And this is a favorite French theme as the open window, the interior exterior scene, which they did in the Renaissance, but <laughs> the French lifted off in a new way. And just the way he does a landscape. You know, it's a big landscape, but if you really look at it, it's almost like one shape with just paint moving in different directions. You know, crusty paint drying and then wet and drying back and forth. He's painting on it. 
And then here's another one that's going hard again. And this one, you know, you look at it and go, wait a minute now. I look at this figure and this figure and they're the same colors. So what that does to me is suggest that the whole painting was this brown color. Then he let it dry. And it could have been a landscape back here, who knows? He decided to put the ocean in some boats and he had a sailboat, he liked to sail. But then he comes in with the bright color and paints in between and makes up this negative shape, which is really nice. You got one up here, the point goes down here. It's like a puzzle piece that just interlocks the two figures. And then all of a sudden it's like, hey, there's Bonard. He painted himself in there, but notice how he's out of scale. It was an ad, it was an add on later. And look at the size of that head to his. It's impossible, you know, unless he's about five years old, which he's not. <laughs> this is right before before he passes, probably the 40s. I think he died in 44. But it's interesting how he just sort of edits right on top of everything, just paints over things and keeps old things, things that work. And it's kind of nice the way you can paint a face without spelling it out, you know. There's just subtle little marks and that's all you need and the light hitting it or it's in the shadow or whatever and in this case it looks like they're in the shadow okay so here's one i got mostly bonards i guess here's another one and this one i you know it's like i'm almost thinking there must have been some people up here and he painted them out because it just looks a little too empty but yet it's a good composition but when you look at it it's sort of like it needs almost a vertical here, a bigger vertical or something, just to chop up the canvas a little bit more. But it still has this great color and this great way of painting things. But when I look at the sky compared to some of the other ones, it looks like maybe you just quit or gave up or you didn't have time to finish it. You know, it's hard to tell. Let's see what the year is. Uh, it doesn't really say. It says on here, 1914 which is impossible he wasn't painting like this in 1914 so anyway all right let's uh just a few more let's find a matisse here okay here's one i saw one like this but never this one and this is kind of a thinner one so you know we look at bernard he's got thick crusty paint but it's flattened out nice nice and level Here's Matisse painting almost like watercolor with a lot of turpentine. And I think he actually had a black mirror with black glass. And I don't know if that's it, but it's in some of his paintings and it gives it a whole different kind of light source. But, you know, he's doing it like the people he loves, Chardin, Cezanne, the tabletop, he's got drawers, but everything's so kind of sketchy and loose. And I think in this one, just the only little bit of a failure is that the flowers are painted so thin that they almost recede into the background and the background becomes stronger than what the subject is. So I guess what I'm saying is it needs to be painted a little bit thicker up in here so it stands out more. And then uh, here's one of his figures. Now he was doing sculpt. It looks a lot like his sculptures, bronze. He did some little sculptures, some big wall sculptures. I think the interesting thing here is, though, I mean, if that's, you think of uh, the Venus we started with, you know, and you look at this, like Titian and Ang, and he's filling oh, up the background with pattern. Something. If that's not there, it's way too empty, number one. It could be windows with stuff, but he's, he solves it with a uh, screen and pattern. When you look at his figure, it's almost like a landscape, and then the face looks like he that doesn't quite add up to the rest of the figure. It's like he had a different face on and he tried too hard and then he just painted it out and kept it simple. I think the interest is right there where the light's hitting. But I mean, just the, the roundness, you can feel everything moving around and in space. And then his color, typical Matisse bright colors, which he loved from Gauguin. And the way even this becomes a pattern. And it says drapery, but at the same time, it doesn't kill you with drapery, like, say, an Ang's painting, which is completely different. It's classicism in reality, hyper-reality. Here's, uh, oh, here's another Matisse. Uh, right there. Let's move it up. Now 
it like that. Okay, like that. And in Nice, out his studio apartment window. And there's a lot of them from this period. And this one just seems, it's nice, but it seems a little undercooked. I, that's a nice area right there. I think, I don't know, that works pretty well. It just seems a little washed out. And if it was a just stronger color, it seems like it would just come forward more, jump out of the canvas a little bit more. But he's got his pattern. He's got his simple, you know, interior, exterior space, which he loved to do the open window, either open this way or open out. And that's a nice compositional device because it takes up a big part of the canvas. And when it takes up a big part of the canvas, it just makes the canvas seem bigger and stronger because it doesn't let you do too many little funny shapes that break it apart, you know, depending on the size of the canvas. Here's another Matisse. This is almost just like demon corn still life. Say, uh, let's see, what year is this? Uh, they got a question mark, 19 something. So my guess is, let's see, when he was doing these, they're probably 1918 right around there but Deben Korn does it like 70 years later or 60 years later it's the same tabletop look at how nice that white highlight is just on that base looks like he had a little trouble here with that so he had to paint a circle because it doesn't quite you know that's one of his sculptures again looking like just the figure we saw and look at the way he paints the fruit how it changes colors it's a little dull little dull then it starts picking up right here and then boom it picks up the light so the same light's hitting coming through here it's coming from this way and yet it doesn't really matter because it's a modern painting i think the beautiful thing about it is i bet he had a lot of stuff back here wallpaper whatever he comes back with that really strong blue violet and paints everything out and even on the table same color drops down on the table and uh it sort of starts to trick your eyes it's like hey is that uh is that um the table or is it the back wall it's that kind of thing i gotta let somebody in here a minute hang on uh where is it Ta -da. okay okay so one more bonard just to uh landscape right you got a figure down here so he's looking out a window some sort of porch or veranda. Look at how he does the trees. It's so abstract and it's so about texture. And I don't think it's one of his best ones, but he's got a lot like this with bigger figures that sort of fit right in here. And I mean, I, I think if I'm going out painting landscapes, I like to look at something like this because I can start to see when I look at some complicated section of trees or whatever that's overwhelming. I just come in here and look at how he used his shapes and how he put them together. And I go out and look at it and say, you know, it's there. You just got to kind of find it. It makes it a lot easier to paint, sort of deciphering them like that. Okay, so let's look at uh, something completely different now. Um, do a little bit of this. I mention him a lot. Willem de Kooning. Yeah. Okay. This is from the 50s, probably 1953, 54. Woman with a bicycle. So he did a whole series of these starting in 1950. The first one, Woman won. I guess he worked on for three years. And it's, you know, it's not the same painting. It's, I mean, one painting in the studio, he's working on 10 at a time or eight at a time. And by abstract expressionist standards, they weren't huge paintings. They were five by six feet, seven by six feet, where some of those Pollocks are huge. They, they get much bigger than that. So they say he was a little more conservative in size and he used a lot of paint. And uh, the first one he had rolled up under his bed. He just wrote it off and he made a lot of experiments leading up to this. And then one day the art historian Mayor Shapiro came over and looked at his work and was like, okay, you know, I'm going, you got anything else? And he pulled it out from underneath his bed, rolled up and said, well, I got this one. It's failing me. He goes, what do you mean failing you? That's your best painting. So he pulled it out and he, you know, it became the icon of American art. It's very similar to this. This is number two. And by number three, they start getting pretty bad because if you spend three years on one painting, and he's rumored to have used electric sander 
and he's sanding off sections and redrawing and repainting and it's called action painting just because it's physical action when you're painting it fast and like I say before like an athletic event like you're wrestling or playing basketball and then um the figures also look animated just because all the paintings look there was part of a figure here there's a mouth that becomes a necklace which suggests it was a bigger head and then he's moving arms all over the place but the thing about these paintings is you can see the layers where he started all the way through you could say 30 let's say there's 30 layers down here 30 different paintings but you can see number one to 30 in the whole paintings oh here he was farther down the road here and he put more paint on and he changed something and it builds up to the finished product. And when you talk about what we talked about with Michelangelo in the beginning, well, here it is in, in New York in the fifties and his early paintings, some of them are very refined because he had a, um, he went to Academy in Holland, much like Rembrandt started. I don't know who started. It might have been Rembrandt's original academy. And he drew for nine years with a pencil, a technical pencil, very precise drawings. And then later in his life, he comes to New York and it all changes and it explodes. And this is the truth of material as oil paint. It's paint, grease, and a brush. And it's constant thinking and editing and painting things out until you get a balance, you know? So something just sort of, looks like it fits right hard to explain but you know after a while it starts to make sense okay so there's the cooning and then now here's something really different here's a guy uh ray parker <coughs> now he was a now you can tell if you know lake matisse there's something really about that that happens in these paintings and they're huge paintings and i saw him by accident I was back in Milwaukee and there was, uh, I went to, uh, there's an art gallery at Marquette University, which really doesn't have an art program. If they do, they farm them out to somewhere else, an art school. So I did, okay, well, I'm going to go into and check it out. And they had a retrospective of his work and these paintings were like 14 by 12 feet and they're very bright and they're painted very directly, but they really were beautiful. I was taken by them. He used to paint circles in oblong shapes on a canvas in the 50s and 60s. And later in his life, he went through this. I forgot when he died. It might have been back in the 70s. But um, some interesting ideas in his work, okay? And then here, this guy I never got before. And he's down in a, they got a whole room of his in the Modern Art Museum. It's Clifford Still. And he's one of the painters that came from New York to teach at the art institute called the school of art at the time him and mark rothko and he was one of those really intellectual painters that had all the right words and philosophy but Stephen corn took a few of his classes and learned something from him as well as mark rothko which i said would be important because he had an open mind his teacher was david park who painted figures you know and this is a lot different than that so you learned a lot about abstraction and i remember walking through this gallery and my friend in Milwaukee, Diebenkorn, or when I met him, uh, Jerry Nordland, the guy that wrote that Diebenkorn book, he got all these paintings for the San Francisco Museum of Art. And I remember me and my big mouth again going, ah, I can't stand them. I don't think they work very well, you know? And he's like, give me the eye. But now I look at him and I think, ah, there's something to him. I, I understand him much better than I did before, but I'm still not crazy about him. But they're huge paintings, and if they weren't that huge, they wouldn't pull off that well. Some paintings just have to be really big. Okay, and then here's, let's see, our friend Richard Diebenkorn in a Berkeley series painting. And you can see that he's basically, it's early in his career, but he's really likes what the Kooning paints, but he's doing it in a landscape, more or less. And if you, you know, you go landscape, well, I, I was across the bay once sitting at the where the ballpark is now. It was called the Mission Rock Inn, and they had a porch where you could eat. And you look across the bay at the Berkeley Hills, and certain times of the day with the sun hitting it, it looked just like this. It was very abstract. Of course, there's no houses and stuff, but it was the same landforms, you know? Very interesting. So, all right. And then here's a guy I might have mentioned. is Bram Van Velde. And he was... Uh, from Belgium 
and I think he died in 1980. But he's probably one of the best European abstract painters that really got it. And when I look at it, I look at this, I go, hmm, it looks from Picasso. He's got a lot of Picasso in his painting, even though there's no pictures or figures or anything. It's just the way it's looped around. And he's, and there, you know, even when I was in graduate school, my teacher showed me one of these paintings and go, this reminds me of your painting. I go, oh, it's so crude and so primitive. And now that's what I like about it is sort of the primitive quality in it and very direct. And his early paintings are really thick and heavy and it didn't work that well. But when he started painting them thin and dripping paint and things, they really have a life to them. Okay. And now let's see. What do we got here? Oh, let's put this up really quick. This is a detail mm. from Jan Van Eyck's Arnolfini marriage. It's up on the wall. It's a mirror. And I might say he's the first painter that came out with things that looked like photographs. And he used mirrors. And you go, wait a minute, mirrors? It's a concave mirror. You know, he's just showing you basically... Oh, wait a minute. Let's put it the right way. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Upside down wedding. Okay, so in the painting, Arnold Feeney looks like a puppet. He's some rich banker and he's got a young wife here, but they're facing you. So in the painting, you see her back in the mirror and then you see Van Eyck and his assistant painting him. And then Van Eyck goes, Johannes Van Eyck witnessed this wedding or something like that. There's a legend right up there. And all the detail in here, it's not a huge painting. When you start looking at the detail, it's really amazing in the way he's using the color. But this is the, the advent of things looking photographic. They just jumped into a different age and it's the Northern Renaissance. So eventually, this wasn't in Italy yet, Eventually, shortly after, it makes it down in Italy to the guy I mentioned before, Bellini, who was the guy Caravaggio liked, who was from his area in Italy. But Bellini was like 100 years before. <laughs> okay. Um, and then, as long as we're in that part of the world, let's just look at a detail from a Vermeer painting who came in the 1600s instead of the 1400s. And that's just a painting on the wall in one of his... Um, we'll look at it in a minute, but look at how simple all that filigree and all that detail is. It's just, and it's gold, but look, it's like yellow ochre and white. It's earth colors. And just the way he sets it up, when your eye backs off, it looks like a hammered frame that's been scrawled into and very, very fancy. And even the landscape, you know, it's a specific painting in a specific place. And in Vermeer's painting, it's just something on the back wall. Now, with Vermeer, you get Vermeer. I mean, look at that. It's just incredible, the detail. He used the camera obscura, you know, and I mean, that's just part of the what happens in that part of the world, especially since it was introduced, they kept perfecting it. And now Vermeer's got a little box like a camera. It'd be a huge camera now, but in those days, it was put into a box and he could project things. Here's another one. I mean, just that detail alone. And he's got all the same trappings, like light coming through the window, the same windows, the same room. Here's the details on the wall, part of a chair cut off, but look at how the light's just flooding the room. And also, I think a lot of things were floating in from the Orient, like the Chinese robes and things were because Holland was, they had the Dutch trading company. They were all over the world and they were bringing things back that were exotic. So he's throwing them back into his paintings. And then the guy's like got a map, you know, he's a geographer. So he's speaking of the time, and, you know, as well as making paintings. Okay, so maybe that's enough for that now. And I, I got a million of them. <laughs> okay, but let's. Oh. Jean Freud, English painter, modern day painter. Him and Francis Bacon were like the modern painters of our time. Jean Freud, self portrait. Not my favorite painter, but some of these are really nice. I think sometimes he just gets a little too crazy with 
not in this one, but with all that craggy kind of texture, the figures start become, becoming something else, uh, more of a piece of furniture. All right, so let's, uh, let's see what's going on here. Let me, uh, yeah, we're doing. So you guys got some paintings you want to show? No. How about it? How about it? All right, Emily, how about if we start with you? Okay. Let okay. me put you in the spotlight here. Okay. What you working on? So, um, I don't know if you remember the piece that I was working on towards the end of class last. Probably. Yeah. yeah. So that was, um, for the other, for my other classmates who had left before I was putting leftover paint that I had from the previous piece I was doing onto this canvas so I didn't waste it. And yeah. then a face started appearing, so I just went with it. And this is what I have so far. Oh, yeah. yeah. Started working yeah. into like the shadow part area here. I need to blend this out. Uh -huh. It's uh it's really got a look of a uh, Picasso during the Rose period. <laughs> the way you're using the color and the way you're painting it, which is really interesting to me. And you're using oil, right? Is it still yeah. wet? No, this it's dry right now. I'm um been letting it dry so that way I can keep adding it without it getting all gross. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I get it. So yeah. So when that's happening, it might instead of sitting around watching the paint dry, it might be a good idea just to sketch out another painting, you know, just a rough sketch drawing. So, you know, it's easier to bounce back on this one then after you get something else going. Are you working on anything else now? I actually, I bought, I'm, I had, I went and bought a bigger canvas. It's a two by three. Oh, good. Um, good. That's a good size. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm going to be sketching out, um, a photo that I have of my great aunt. It's uh -huh. going to be a present for my cousin. He's Good. Gonna... Well, now you got you got two weeks. Yeah. To work, you know, because next Friday, just keep working on it. Mm -hmm. and we'll we'll see what it looks like when you before you give it away. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. And any questions? Anything else you got going? Um. No. I think the only question that I would have, because I've never done hair. Before, okay. okay wouldn't know what to do if i wanted to add hair to this or to the other piece that i'm gonna do i think you should find a, a painting that's similar like a portrait painting uh -huh. with, with hair and just take a piece of tracing paper and trace over the hair and look how they put it together with shapes okay dark and light shapes and look at how the shapes look and that wouldn't be that hard to transfer the same idea to something like this although with the head melting into the background kind of works nice too, but I'll, yeah. I'll let that go, you know, but it does work. It's interesting because you get a sense that the whole, the whole head's there, you know? Yeah. So anyway, it's going good. It's going good. All right. Just okay. when you feel like you got to jump into it, go. Okay. And get working on that big canvas in the meantime. Okay. I will. Okay. Good enough. Thank All you. right. Let's uh, see what else is going on here flap my guns some more yet uh oh yeah i knew it yeah you're you're right in line there yeah okay. right so i'll show you what i did um uh, monday and tuesday i i took charcoal and um you know did this and that and started painting yeah and i finished this that's some really nice color did you use masking tape on that I did on one and it then so I uh, I just did it by hand. Excellent. The color's excellent. It's really a nice design. I love the way you cut off that corner on the bottom with a big right angle. I I I I not did it in two days. I really I I'm really excited by it. And that the white works really good as a color in there because it looks painted. Uh, and it, it is just like a very uh, light, creamy white. 
Reminds me of flags on a sailboat, ceremonial flags, something like that. Nice and bright and not garish or obnoxious. The color is really saturated and the black means a lot in this painting because it makes the colors really jump out. You know, it really makes them come alive. Yeah, nice job. You're done with it, right? I'm done, yeah. Well, I would be. You don't yeah. want to tempt the fates on that one. No, but... Uh, not- but it Turn it sideways once. Uh, the other way. Yeah, this way it would be. Ooh. Yeah, that's more of looking out a window almost with a drapery uh, cast across the corner of the window. That works that way too, but, you know, keep it the way you painted it. It's strong. Uh, but that's a good sign when it works different ways. Too. Is this the way I did it? Oh, yeah. I, I had like uh, two different colors here, so I did a lot of overpainting with yeah the that's why i think the color works so good is the layers yeah that, that, if that, i was just if you did that one layer it never looked that good yeah. okay, okay. Well, thank you. it's nice and smooth and saturated very good i really enjoyed doing that okay you should and do some more to, try to change went, that around a little bit compositionally and maybe do one or two more i i went to michael i but i had Oh, and then I had by half an hour after I finished on Tuesday. So, so I started just using some of the paint. So this is the beginning of a new of another one. Okay, all right. And well, the beat for know, a beginning. It just shows yeah. good. Because you're working over the whole thing. Right. Yeah, I am. I've That's- had so much fun watching you demonstrate. So I finally made up my mind, okay, I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah, and you just keep building up the layers and the color will get as good as the other one. Right. And you're and changing the forms a little bit. You got some curves in there now too. Good. Yeah, yeah so exactly. And and it develops as, you know, I, as I put paint on. So it's good. fun. And you're, then, you're breaking into new territory. I think so, Michael. And I was a total disaster with with uh, the Estero, which I painted. And, oh, yeah, yeah. And I, I just can't figure out what to blank, blank do with it. I think at this point, I just leave it for now. Um, okay. Resolved a lot of things in it. I mean, it's nice and clear and strong. Um, I just sit on this one. Let's look at it again later. Okay. Uh, if I look at it again down the road, it'll tell me if you need to do anything else or if it's good enough the way it is, but I'm thinking it looks pretty good. All right. All right. Just right. for all the things you painted out and the things you repainted, it's become a nice painting. It's a strong painting. And it's interesting that that landform on the right is a triangle like your abstract paintings uh, that you just yeah. showed me, you know? So the same things sort of reoccur looking differently in other paintings with other themes, but yeah, it's interesting that it's you yeah. and it's coming out that way, you know? Yeah. Okay, good. I'll let it be. Yeah, let it be for a while. Okay. And just glance with it out of your eye. And if you're painting on other paintings, you might look at it and get an idea, or you might just leave it alone. We'll see, okay? Okay, well, thanks, Michael. All right. And, uh, that, I guess that's about it for me this week. Okay. Well, that's good. I'm glad to see this abstract paintings are starting yeah. to happen. I you did a few good ones before when we were in class. Right, you know me well, and um, yeah, it's where I feel really good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi. I just want to say that I really, really, really like um, the blue in that painting, the the last one. Uh, I I love all the different um, shades of blue that you have. It's like, I don't know, it's one of my favorite colors. So just seeing like all the different like variety of shades and and how you messed with it. It's really, really cool. Well, yeah. thank you, Emily. That's really because strong. it wasn't really working strong. and I kept putting on new blues and purple yeah. and yellow. And so, thank you. Right. Well, it's working. I am so glad to be here. What's your secret? What's your secret? Okay. <laughs> hey, it's just being with all of you guys. You're, you're right. inspiring me. Thank you. Well, 
with that said, see you later. <laughs> later, later. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Alexandra, Ozzy, are you there? Hang on. Let me uh, get this Hello. Going. Hello. Okay, there you are. What's your name? Um, so me and my ADHD, we can't just stick to one painting yeah, and right. finish it, like, ever. Eventually, so, they'll become finished. Oh. Uh, there's, there's wow. this one that I've already Wow. Done. Is that brand new? What was that? Is that brand new? This is a brand no, new No, it's something that I've been continuing to work on, and... Um, I wanted something with earth bones because uh -huh. it's like, like, I, uh, um, I, I really like it, what you're doing. I mean, you do what you want with it. It's, it could be a finished painting now, but you've got to satisfy yourself. But nice job. I like the sort of camouflage. Did you, did you break that down on a computer somehow? That image? No? Nice. No. I like the way you did those shades. You know, the, on the light on the body, and the colors are really nice, and that blue background's excellent. Just the right color for the warm tones. So what are you going to do, paint the butterflies, or what? Yeah, I want to... Oh, your mic cut out. Sorry. Oh, there it is. Um, she's all... Okay. All right. So I want the butterflies multicolored. Okay. And if you do the butterflies multicolor, I don't think you really have to add anything more into that painting. You might just refine what's in there. But if you get too much in there, it's going to take away from the figure. Okay. Yeah, I don't think you're going to add anything. Okay. Good. And then right. I'm going to this. Mm -hmm. What did you do? What is, is that paper? What are the flowers? Glue them on. Ah, oh, your mic's out again. It still can't hear. I don't I know how to fix that. There you are. There you are. Now I can't. Okay. Yes, I glued on the flowers. Okay. Well, what are you gonna do with it? Is it it? It feels empty and sad to me. Oh, I think I want to like add more flowers and I would probably do that with yarn because I sewed, this is sewed on. Okay. Hey, how about, I'd say, okay, I'm glad you're working with this idea. Uh, if you want to balance things out, you could paint things a little bit thicker that you paint. You know, like the leaves could use a little more paint thicker, gooier, and the hand, you know, you can just puff it up a little bit. If you put flowers on with yarn, it wouldn't hurt to paint one or two flowers that sort of slip in with the stuff that's stuck on. You know what I mean? Sort of camouflage. Yeah. Uh, but let's see what happens. I mean, also the background, I mean, basically, probably what it means, since you put those flowers on, they're really three-dimensional, so it's like you almost need more paint to look three Three, like the background, you could rough it up. Even if you paint it smooth, you could put another coat on, something like that. Just build okay. it up a little bit more. But it's an interesting idea, and I'd love to see where it goes when you're finished with it. Then we can take a good look at it. But it's interesting that you're collaging already. You're putting collage on the canvas, and that can work too. But we got to talk about how to make it work with the paint. And that's what I just said. Make it thicker, you know. So good show. You got anything else? Thank you. Um, I'm working on this. Oh, you can't even see this. Um, I don't know how to say this. This smaller painting. Oh, I like the nice light watercolor. That I'm sketching color. it out. Yeah. All right, you got a bunch of small canvases you're going to do? It? Yeah, you? I have like four others. Okay, good. Make a series. You know? Well... You can make a series thin like that, and if you don't like three of them, you can always paint them thicker and something else. So anyway, 
a good show. Um, I'd say just keep cranking them out. With that figure painting, you really got something there. Okay? And then we'll see the other ones okay. later. Good. Keep it up. It looks like things are changing Thanks. and your ideas are growing. You know? And that's what they're supposed to do. So good for you. All right. Thank you. Anything else? Get it? Okay. Here we go. See you later. Okay. We have Ava. Ava, come in, Ava. Are you there? There Hi. you are. Okay. So. Hi. Okay. Oh, there you are. Let me uh, get you in the big picture. Okay, there you are. Okay, what you doing, Ava? So, um, as far as for your class goes, I came to make the frog darker uh -huh. and then I thought about I didn't like the size of the circle uh -huh. so I came to address that before I painted it in okay. and then and then once I started doing that it just took me back to I really want to start another one instead of working on this one but I will finish yeah, yeah. this it's looking good the way it is too I mean even unfinished I I look at him and I keep thinking he's like singing jazz, <laughs> a jazz singer. <laughs> and then for the hands, um, last time you told me to work more on the hands, but I just, I don't, I mean, it's not like something you can tell me what to do, but I don't know what else to do. Um, I'd say just make that thumb show up more because from when you zoomed in on it, the other one, the one sticking down. Because uh -huh. when you zoomed in on it, I could see it better. But from a little distance, it gets a little jumpy. I mean, the top, the other thumb that you just pointed to on top, and that top part by the bracelets works beautifully. From a distance, when I get down, that thumb and the other fingers okay. underneath, yeah, it looks like one thumb. Okay. You know, it's hard to see the distinction between the figures, fingers. So I would say if you just maybe outlined or got a little bit of darker on that thumb so it pops out more, it would be much easier to see. Okay. 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 But it still looks good. I mean, it just needs to be resolved down there just a little bit. Cool. Yeah, I, I mean, I think so too. I just didn't know what to approach because I've been looking I mean, at it. If it still, you know, sort of gets jumbled up down there, then it's the finger that crosses underneath the thumb, the white finger. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. this one's not, yeah. That one definitely yeah, needs work. a little bit more show up a little bit more and then I think that would do it yeah but you won't know until you try but I mean it's just little touches and I mean basically the painting's there and it's just those little things that drive you nuts sometimes you got to sit around a while and then when you least expect it you pick up a brush and you nail it yeah man it's it's so funny when you point it out it's like oh yeah that's so obvious that totally needs work yeah. But, I mean, just that one section, other than that, it's beautifully painted. Thank you. And for a small canvas, it's very striking because of what you didn't put in it, you know? It's nice and spare and strong, and it makes the canvas look a lot bigger when you don't put a lot of stuff in it. Huh. Okay. Okay. Nice. Thank you. This is a triptych. Uh -huh. You can't, the, the light, it's this all about, it's all about color. And I want to add green and purple, green here, purple here, and then the middle one is going to get a mixture of both colors. Okay. What's the one on top? Is that part of the? No, this was. Um, this is something I need to work on. It's like I've just been sitting with it for a while to see what I want to do with it. It's a nice painting. So are those other two. Thanks. Let's put the triptych down. Let's really take a look at it. Well, you're putting a, it looks like there's a lot of paint on it, a lot of layers. Yes, I like using. That's really good because it really carries from a distance, you know. It has a lot of power in the color and the pattern. Very nice. Sorry about that. Background. In your studio. Yes. And then I want to show you one more. Um, I try to keep it simple with the, yeah, you just... I got it. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then I want to take that and do like a series out of it with going different directions. 
Those are really nice. And then so you got you put some thick blobs on those paintings, huh? A little bit. It's not. There's not that much paint. It's a um, just a. I put gold on the base and then I go over it. It works really well. Thanks. You know, it's almost it's like looking down into a pond, a big deep pond full of fish, or something like that. You know, it's got a nice space in it. Thank you. And the color was beautiful. I noticed the color in that painting. There's like a blue green. There. Yeah. Yeah. Right out the window, shining on the leaves on the tree, the same color on my computer anyway. So it's like it jumped in the window and came on your painting. <laughs> <laughs> it's really too bad all these classes aren't in person because everybody's yeah, work is, yeah, as I you know. know. We gotta, we got to convince the, the powers that be. <laughs> this, yeah. What do they know? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's it. All right, good. Good Thank show. you. It's uh, looks like you're learning. You're learning. Painting, you're trying, right? You're, you're stepping out on new trails. Happy trails. Good for you. All right. Thanks. See you Bye. later. Okay, let's go back to the gallery view. All right, so let's see. Donnell? Donnell, are you there? There you are. Hang on. <laughs> so... Spotlight video. There you are. Uh, okay, so I just have been messing around a little bit. I am trying to do something more abstract, and so oh, I'm wow. kind of adding. My, oh, my, that's some very nice color and really interesting shapes that you threw together. It's, uh, wow, I like it. It's kind of, it's like surrealism, but in the abstract expressionist vein of surrealism um just natural forms that fit together really well but boy that purple that violet so strong in that pink it's beautiful and then you put the right color to hold it back that reddish brown with the black or blue in it in the foreground one, are you done with this i don't think so i just keep adding stuff until i i'm trying to keep going <laughs> um, um unless you think it's done <laughs> i would suggest that before you add any more on it start another one and get the other one as done as this one and compare the two. And then it'll give you more uh, information where to go with it, if you should do more or not. Okay. And if you do more on it, you should get the idea will be in the painting you started. There will be something in there you can use. Okay. And, you know, while you're in this sort of mind space for this kind of painting. But I think there's some very nice stuff in it. And again, the simplicity of it makes it so strong. And then there's the complexity of subtle color inside the big shapes, which is really excellent. Okay. okay. All right. So what else you got there? So then I just started another little still life. I have these tiny glass oh, yeah. that I like. And so I'm kind of trying to catch the reflections and I really love the highlights on there and the reflections. It's beautiful. You know, with that bright color in the back, what are you going to do with that? I'm going to tone it down a little bit. I was, as I was painting, it was catching up this, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to wait until this is all dry. The way things stand now, looking at this painting, if that whole painting was the blue color, it'd still be beautiful. Okay. You know, just a flat blue, like the one you got on the table, just run it up to the top, and you wouldn't necessarily need any more objects. It's like a big blue plane. And then these shiny things just sort of radiate, and it still makes the painting seem big without adding anything. Okay. That's yeah, really when nice. I get it in the camera, it looks better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they always do. <laughs> I notice that when I'm painting and I'm looking at the screen, it's like, hmm, looks pretty good. And I look back at it and go, hmm, looks different. <laughs> so, all right, that's nice. So yeah. figure that one out, but you could really you know and that one quick maybe i don't know okay okay I, I just there's a kind of a lot of you know reflection on the table itself too that i yeah it's beautiful play with the so, light's so subtle it increases in temperature it gets hot the blue and then it tones down to a greenish blue it's very nice thanks yeah it's, it's still working out. okay you got anything else or um, no, that's pretty much it. I, all right. That's 
Hollywood. <laughs> All right, I get it. I'll see you later. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here we go. Uh, okay, so let's see here. Here we go. So many colors. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Hello. <laughs> Oh, where'd you go? Oh, there. Sorry, keeping up. Hang on. Put this on. Okay. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? Hold on. Let me grab it. Okay. So, I'm the one that did the cow skull. Got it. And this time, I wanted to do carnivorous plants. Uh huh. Beautiful. Um, so I'm like, I have one of those plants like uh -huh. right behind me. Okay. So, and then, um, watch your fingers. <laughs> but okay. so what are you thinking yeah. about the painting? Is it done? No, I need to have like more, like you can't see it really, but I there's see. a I little bit yeah. and I need more there. Um, yeah. and then, and then, yeah. I don't know. I got, I got one suggestion. Take it with a grain of salt, but the background, stronger blue. Stronger blue? Yeah, brighter blue background. Okay. I did with like colors, spongy. With colors, what's that? I said I did like a spongy thing. Whatever you want to do, but I just make it stronger, stronger blue. And it'll okay. look great with the greens and all the colors you got in there. It'll just make it stronger. That's the best way I can put it. You know, and um, I'm thinking of a stronger blue and how it's going to work with the greens on the Venus flytrap. Beautiful. I can just sort of envision it. And you don't have to do, you know, you don't have to add anything to the painting. You can just do your detail, what you want to do. But just think about that. And you might just try a corner to see how it looks like up on top where it's simpler. You can just paint a section and see if you think it's going to work. If it doesn't, you can rub it down right away, you know, and stick with whatever you want to do with it. But I just get the sense that a little bit stronger blue is just going to make it a stronger painting. And it's nice okay. already. It's nice the way you laid everything out and just the flow of the painting, you know? So that's just an added thing, an added benefit, a little bit stronger blue. But everything right. else, it's great. Not right now, no. Oh, no, just, you know, you put it off the back burner or whatever. But right now, nice idea. Thank Do you. More Do more of those. You could do a giant fly trip on a small canvas, you know, something like that. I don't yeah. know. Thank you. you. Know, not me, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You got anything else? No, nope, not right now. All right. All right. Thanks. Keep forging ahead. I will. All righty. Here we go. Um, okay. Paula. Paula. Come in, Paula. Paula, there you are. <laughs> hey, you know, you're on one side. And I, now I get it. I start looking at the other side. That's where everybody's popping up on the screen. So let me, uh, there. Okay, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Okay, and so you what are you working on? Well, I finished the painting I showed you last time. Nice, okay. Very well done. I love the colors in the face. The way you mix the greens and the gray greens and the smoke is interesting because it doesn't take away from it at all. It kind of breaks it up in a real interesting way. The gray background, uh, beautiful. The color of the fingers that are warm on top of the brownish gray earth tones is very nice. And just the size of the face inside that canvas is very strong. How big you made it. Good one. Okay. So did you start anything else now, or? Well, I painted this little one. Um, okay, nice. Are you done with it? Yeah. Okay. I'm not really good with flowers, but I just wanted to try it. Out. Like, yeah. I think you have to do that. You got to challenge yourself. Uh -huh. That's what keeps it interesting. If you painted everything you knew you could paint all the time, it'd get kind of boring. Exactly. You know. So, mm -hmm. Good. Uh -huh. And if you want to do more flowers, do more. That's a perfect size for them. Just make them big, you know? Yeah, I think I'll try it. And I started a new one, but I don't want to show it because I just have a background. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, all right. Yeah, all right. Up. Well, you got to Now you got two weeks to get some painting done. So we'll check back later after the holiday. All right. Okay. 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 See you later. Okay. All right. Let's go. And yeah, moving right along. Let's see. Oh, uh, Marissa. Marissa, are you there? Marissa. Uh, no. <laughs> yes, I see you're there. Okay, so now there you are in the mystery spot. Let's see. Spotlight. Hello. <laughs> so um, what do you got, Marissa? Um, I have one main I'm just oh, painting. Nice job. I did it with my dog. <laughs> hey. Nice job. He's blowing in the breeze, the way you got the hair mm -hmm. flowing. Excellent brush work. I yeah. enjoy drawing hair, so I thought I, I would probably enjoy painting it too. Excellent. Now you'll have to send em Emily some of your uh, secrets. She wants to know how to paint hair. <laughs> so <laughs> you're done with it or no? No, I think there's more detail I could add to like the chin and the lower area. Oh. All right. So I'd say add the detail you want. Right now it's gravy. I mean, it, it's there, but you know, put the detail you want in, but I wouldn't do too much to it because it really looks nice. Mm -hmm. All right. So just finish her up the way you want to, but I, I guess what I'm saying is don't really add too much. I mean, you yeah. got a simple, strong composition. And the eye of the dog's painted great next out in the nose. Excellent. And just the flow though, the way you painted the hair flowing in that wave-like patterns, excellent. Mm -hmm. Nice job. Thank you. Okay. You got anything else? No, that's it. Okay. Well, that's enough. It was something completely new, right? Mm -hmm. so just keep moving. And if you like doing, you know, you could do a series of dogs or whatever, your dog, or <laughs> just do one with a big paw. <laughs> anyway, good. Looking good. Keep it up, okay? All right. I guess I'm going now. I'll see you later. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Lena, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Okay, Lena. Uh, where are you? There you are. Okay, hang on. Uh, spotlight on Lena. How you doing? I'm good. Okay, what do you got? I got this. I'm still working on it. Wow. Did, did I see that last time or no? No. No, that's brand new, huh? Yeah. I love the green and the thick paint. That you, hold it up again. Are you done with it? No. It's going good so far. What are you thinking of doing? I mean, I'm in mean, the sky. I think it's... Um... It'd be a little lighter okay um that's like more that's what you used to paint before but it just looks better because you got more experience now and you're dealing with the color and the drawing in a new way so that's all good uh, what else are you working on anything else yeah i got this one this one's done mm. oh yeah very nice looks like arizona or something like that but your color it's getting so much better and then you're getting better at just using the paint different ways like scrubbing and laying it on thick uh it's like all the good things are happening in there that you did before but now like i said before it looks like you know more you know you're experimenting a little bit more and it's paying off anything else yeah this is the last one this one's very uh undone but it's over here. Well, right away, that pink against that brown is excellent. I love that as an abstract painting now. Stop! <laughs> no, nice. What's it going to be, a big landscape? It's going to be a lake. Oh, a lake? You going to put anything in the lake? or? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Hey, you got a buddy there. Yeah, I do. Your, your critic's behind you. <laughs> hey, so, Lena, it looks good. I just keep cranking on him and, you know, get as many done as you can, but... Right now, the color is pretty nice in all of them. And then the paint handling is just getting more like you've been doing it longer, it looks like. So that's good for you. That's a big, 
Yay. All right. So any questions? Any answers? No, okay. I'll see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. All right, so let's see. Rocio. Oh, boy. Let me. There we go. There, there you are. Hang on. Michael. Hi. Let me. Uh, oh, there you are. How you doing? Um, I don't have anything to show it to you. I'm so. What do you got behind you? That abstract painting. Uh, well, it's unfinished. Let's see it. Bring it forward. You already see it, I guess. But it's not finished yet. Uh, Boy, I love the color in that. And again, it's yeah. you worked on it more since the last time I saw it, didn't you? Yeah. And yeah, a little bit, but not as the, uh, the way I wanted. It's you chopped up the face. It looks good. It really looks good, the design of it, and the way you're using the color, you know? And yeah. I think, I, I guess, you know, in my mind, it could be finished, but if you want to keep working on it, I think it's, it's just- a little bit over here. I don't know, maybe here too, or I don't know. It's, up here. Yeah, it's, just, it's just the layers of paint. It doesn't need anything drawn into it or any new anything. It's just what's already there. You can just keep, if you just put a layer of paint on it and see if it's mm. the way you like it, but- that's what it needs is just maybe working with the color instead of thinking about that because it's such a strong design. Yeah. You know, it's such a nice abstract, abstract painting. So just see what you think, but the color right now, it looks good. looks very good. It stood out from the background behind you. That's why I picked on it and said, Hey, okay. Okay. Thank you. you. But okay. I don't have a, nothing else. That's all right. Just, uh, you know, I guess it is, is just keep it going. You know, what do you got a drawing going there? Yeah, but I want to put color, a real color, and that's I'm stuck on that. Well, oh, okay. Well, what are you thinking? I mean, you're just gonna have that face and, and yes, hair, yeah, and hair, and then a background and part of the body, right? Yep. Start yeah. with painting the background. Just pick a color. Yeah. And, and paint it, and then see. Start painting the face and just see how whatever you're painting on the face, how it relates to the background color. Yeah. Just remember that the background can always be changed. That's a simple change if it's not the right color. I don't know if that happens, but when I, I try to paint it, I'm going to stop and say, no, I'm going to make a mistake. And it's, it's when I, I get stuck, really stuck on it. Yeah. But, well, you know, a good thing maybe is you got you got a drawing there on that canvas. Sometimes having another one drawn out too, so you got two to pick from. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're stuck on one, you can just jump to. And I know that sounds like, well, I want to paint this picture, but if you break up your attention, sometimes it's just easier to get more things done, and you don't waste as much time getting stuck. You know, yeah. it's yes, just like, yes. well, this one's not working. The heck with it. I'll take it out on this one, and then all of a sudden it's like, wow. That looks pretty good. And then it gives you more power to go back to the other one and do something with it because you already got a keeper, you know, yes. you don't have to worry about ruining it. So, all right. Okay. Well, good. Keep it Thank going. You. It looks like from where you started, you're learning. It's changing. Okay. okay. It's changing in a good way. So just keep it up. And when you get a feeling of doing something that you want to do and you don't think you're supposed to be doing it or just do it. Just do it because that's the only way you're going to figure it out. And you never know what you're going to hit on. And in the end, if they're that awful that you think, you can always paint over them. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Yeah. Yes, right. thank you. All right. Later. Let's see. Gallery view. Uh, Alicia. Alicia. Are you there? Hello? Yeah. Yes, you are. Okay. There you go. Let's get you in the spotlight here. Your camera's not on now. Wait, let's try that again. Spotlight video. No, Alicia. Yeah. Uh, your camera's not on. Sorry, my computer is a bit slow today. Oh, really? Yeah. Then we can't look at it, right? 
There's no way of showing it. Testing. One, two. Testing. <laughs> it's like being in a music studio. Can't hear you, Alicia, and I can't see you. So if that's the case, we'll look at you double next time. Okay? Just try to get that computer hooked up somehow, fixed. I know it's a pain, and it comes and goes, but, you know, what are you going to do? We're at... We're at the mercy of electricity. There you go. Boy. <laughs> Good. There you go. Okay, what you been working on? I've I've actually been working on this so far. All right. You got a volcano? Yeah. All right. Um, what do you are what are you gonna do with it? Are you done? I'm not done with it yet, but I but I feel like I'm gonna make it a bit more tropical than okay. what it is right now. Okay. I love the smoke coming out of the spout. Thank you. Excellent. And then the, the cloud pattern is, that's really nice. It reminds me of the last painting you showed me with the landscape and the clouds in a way. And I think, uh, again, it's strong because of the simple composition and I'm getting more into the paint, the way you're painting it and the way the paint looks has got a very nice look to it. And I still keep throwing out that name Milton Avery and don't worry, I'll try to find something on them that you can just show you what I'm talking about. But it really has a likeness to this American artist that painted in the 40s and 50s. And I find them very interesting. That's what I, I'm starting to see in your work. So good for you. What else you got? Anything? No, I don't have anything else. I'm, I'm working on the... your, mic's, your mic's going out, the microphone. Still can't hear. Can you turn up the volume or? No. <laughs> Still can't hear. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to read your lips though. <laughs> Any? Testing. No. All right. Do you have any other paintings you can hold up? All right. Well, look, since I can't hear you, just keep up the good work. Keep plowing them out. Get a couple more done. I think it's going really good. Oh, great. Here comes a truck. Wait. <laughs> oh, this is really smooth. <laughs> All right, Alicia. I'll see you after the holiday. All right. Then we'll check things out again. And get that mic fixed. All right. Bye bye. All right, so let's see. Uh, where is it? Uh, eh. Well, what do we got here? Uh, temper. Yeah, I think that's it. Did I get everybody? Scream if I didn't. I think I did. All right, so look, we got a holiday coming up so I won't see you next Friday I'll see you in two weeks and then just try to you know keep using your time to get some painting done I know I am and I'm gonna make more messes with oil and then pretty soon you can look at them but I better let them dry or I'll have it all over the computer screen and you won't see anything uh, <laughs> yet oh. you're gonna ask something yeah I was going to ask, what about the people painting that you did something else to? Can we see that one? Or is that now wet oil? It's wet oil. Oh, yeah. And it's okay. abstract. You wouldn't right. recognize it. Oh, okay. I couldn't take it anymore. I was sitting in the chair after I got through with you guys. I was sitting in a chair looking at it, and I had seen all these faces and stuff. And I'm thinking, yeah, that'd be great. I'm get And something wouldn't let me do it. And I uh, kept glancing over at that abstract painting I showed you on the poster. Oh, yeah. I love, I love to paint that way, and I don't have to worry about making a picture, and I can just get in. So I whipped out the oils and just started <laughs> going into it. And it's like, ah, that felt good. And then I pulled out four more canvases and started doing the same thing. Uh, and now uh, I've, I've made a monster. I've created a monster. Uh, uh, but they really have to dry, and then I'll show you. They're abstract. And they're well, kind of California, kind of Diebenkorn kind of okay. painting. Not exactly, but no, it's like I'm... a decent Diebenkorn. And I'll be the next one in books. I'll show you. Okay, I'm 
ready for it. Works for me, sorry. The world is ready for you, Michael. Just do uh, it. Yeah, the world is not ready for me. <laughs> oh, they <laughs> should be. Pause. Okay. Listen, ha- well, you happy guys. Thanksgiving. Yeah. And I guess we can cut it a little short. Wait a minute. Yeah, that's okay. All right. So you guys all have a good holiday. You too. And I'll see you in two weeks. And we'll meet again. Bye. All right, right, Michael. Thank you. Bye. 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 Happy Thanksgiving. See you later.